I want to welcome you guys. Thank you guys so much. Uh, tonight, I've asked uh, Mike Doyle to lead us. Um, I've known Mike Doyle for quite a bit of time, and um, I'm going to tell you that I've seen him grow. Um, I remember the uh, Luis Palau days of us uh, working together, and, uh, you know, I, I saw him plant a church in New York, and, you know, the guy's been such an encourager to me because there was a time uh, that I resigned from Ram 48 and I really was kind of like not sure, you know, about getting back into ministry or what I was doing, you know, because I moved to Texas and then I had to move back because my father-in-law had brain cancer. But Mike really spoke a lot of like the humility he has. Like, I mean, he met me in the middle of New York somewhere. I think it was the Plaza Hotel and he just spoke a lot of uh, encouraging words to me. So I uh, thought of that and I was like, man, we really need encouraging words right now. So uh, who not to ask a guy who's on the front lines right now? I mean, this guy is in, uh, he lives in Queens, but his church is actually, it's so cool. It's right on Union Square. Am I right? Like you get off Union Square and you're, you're right there. Yeah, well, we actually, we moved up to 24th Street. So we're kind of up in like um, the Flatiron Nomad neighborhood, which I actually like better. So but yeah, we were in Union Square for a lot of years. And then right before the, the virus hit, we moved up to 24th Street. We were by Madison Square Park and just a really, really, really nice, great neighborhood. So, awesome. yeah. Well, well, you know, I'm, again, I'm going to let you take it on, but I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what you, what's been going on, man. So thank you so much, Mike Doyle. Awesome. Well, hey, guys, um, the title for the message I want to share is Treasure from trials. And there's two verses I want to look at. It's 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. And Peter writes, and if you have a Bible, you can open it with me. If you don't, don't worry about it. Just You can just keep watching. But listen to what Peter writes. Peter says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's an amazing passage, and I just want to take a few minutes, and I'm going to unpack it for you. And kind of what I want to do with our time is I'm going to teach, but I think with Zoom and online, it can be a little challenging to kind of keep people's attention. So I'll teach for about maybe 15 minutes maybe 20 minutes if I'm being long-winded. And then what we'll do is we'll open it up. And I want to talk about it. I want all of us to dialogue and discuss this message, these verses. So be following along with me, but also be thinking about stuff that you want to ask. Be thinking about things you want to talk about with the group. And we'll make this fun and we'll make it interactive and we'll kind of bring everybody in. But let me do this. I'm going to pray. And then we're just going to jump in and kind of unpack these verses. So let me pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for... Tony and Yuli, Lord, I love them. Um, they're good friends. I've had the privilege of, of serving with them, Lord, all over the world in so many different capacities. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Tony and Yuli fan, Lord. I'm a Christian skaters fan. And Lord, I, I believe the, that your abs, the absolute best days are still ahead of them and you have so much for them. God, I thank you for everybody that's tuning in right now. Lord, they could have been doing a thousand other things, but they chose to, to tune in for this Bible study. And so, God, I pray you would speak to them, you would encourage them, you would refresh them. And I pray that, Lord, this message would be life giving and super encouraging. Bless this time now, Lord, speak through me in Jesus' name. Amen. You know what's fascinating is that there's a pattern, and you see it over and over and over again throughout the Bible, where God often brings some of the greatest good out of some of the greatest trials. I mean, you look at Joseph. Joseph was. He was serving in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife comes on to him. He resists her because he doesn't want to sin against God. She grabs his robe. He runs out naked, and she, she says, he tried to rape me. And even though Joseph didn't, uh, didn't at all, Joseph ends up in prison for a crime he didn't commit. But because he was in prison, he was able to interpret Pharaoh's dream, and he goes on to become the second most powerful man in Egypt. He basically goes on to become the CEO of Egypt. And because he's a CEO of Egypt, he's able to save his family from famine. From his family would come Jesus. And so in a sense, because of Joseph's unjust prison sentence, 
Joseph saved Jesus. If the Jewish people would have died of famine, there never would have been a Jesus. And it was because of Joseph's unjust time in prison that God was able to bring about incredible good. You know, it was when Moses was alone in the wilderness, and the wilderness in the Bible always represents a place of struggle, of dryness, of trial, of testing. It was as Moses was in the wilderness, and also Moses was 80 years old when God appeared to him in the burning bush and said, Moses, I want you to deliver the Israelites. And maybe you're watching today, and you feel like you're in a wilderness. You feel like you're in a dry place. Maybe you feel like, you know, your best days are ahead of you. You know, well, you're in good company. You're in the same exact company as Moses. It was when Moses was in the wilderness that God revealed himself to him and gave him the greatest calling of his life. It was when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace because they refused to bow down and worship Nebuchadnezzar, that Jesus appeared to them in the flames. You know, that Hillsong song, Another One, uh, uh, Another in the fire, that's what that song is about. It's an excellent song. It's about Jesus appearing to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego while they were in the flames. But you know what? If they hadn't been in the flames, they never would have had that amazing encounter with Jesus. You know, it was when Samson was blinded and in chains that he was able to push down the pillars of the palace that he was in with the leadership of the Philistines, who were the great enemies of Israel, that he was able to push down the pillars, collapse the building, and wipe them all out. And I love what it says in Judges 16.30. It says, thus Samson killed many more when he died than when he lived. You know, it was, while, it was while Paul was in prison, and prison is the ultimate form of quarantine. You know, a lot of you guys down in South Florida are in normal homes, but almost everybody in, city, almost everybody in New York City lives in, a, lives in an apartment. And we've been in our apartments so long, you know, our apartments can start to feel like prisons. But, you know, but listen to this. It was when Paul was in prison, again, for a crime he didn't commit, that he wrote three of the most, he wrote four of the most powerful epistles of all of Paul's, you know, writings. While he was in prison, he wrote Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon, and they're called the prison epistles. You know, Paul was trapped inside. He couldn't go outside. He was trapped in his home. But what Paul did is he redeemed the time. He used the extra time that he had to write some of his masterpieces. And part of the legacy of Paul's life came from Paul being trapped inside for two years. You know, there's another story when, when Paul was planting a church in Philippi and they end up, him and Silas, end up being beaten and thrown into prison. But what did they do? If I was beaten and thrown into prison for a crime I didn't commit, I'd just sit around and feel sorry for myself. But what does Paul do? Paul and Silas, it says that they were singing in the night. And as they were singing in the night, God brought this earthquake. He set them free. And because of that, the Philippian jailer and his family would all end up coming to Christ. You know, I love the lyrics to the new Elevation song, Graves in the Gardens, because they're singing about this biblical pattern. That's exactly what this song is about. And I think that that song, Graves in the Garden by Elevation, was actually a prophetic song. I think, that God, I think that God gave them wisdom to know that as a country, we were about to go into this really heavy trial, and through them, God blessed the church with this amazing song. And listen to the lyrics. You turn mourning into dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You see, that's the God of the Bible. That's Yahweh. That's the God that we worship. The God that we worship, the God that we follow as Christians is the God that brings treasure out of trials. He does it over and over and over again because that's who he is. That's who Yahweh is. That's who the God of the Bible is. And also, you know what, you see this pattern in secular history. Do you know that Shakespeare wrote King Lear and Macbeth while he was in quarantine uh, during the plague? Isaac Newton developed his theory of gravity while he was in quarantine. Ulysses S. Grant, who was uh, the Union commander who defeated the Confederacy during the Civil War, and he would go on to become a two-time president of the United States, it was as he was dying from throat cancer that he wrote his autobiography, which went on to become a masterpiece and set his family up financially, but it came out of the hardest trial of his life as he was dying from throat cancer. And we see other examples of this principle. You know, it's when, it's when grapes are crushed that the grape juice can flow out of them and it can become wine. You know, the word Gethsemane, and Jesus spent the last night of his life in this place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden of Gethsemane was on this hillside uh, just east of the city of Jerusalem. 
But the word Gethsemane, it's a very interesting word. It means olive press. You see, because it's only as olives are pressed, it's as you apply pressure to olives that the olive oil flows out of them. And olive oil is amazing. You can uh, cook with olive oil. You can eat olive oil. You can burn it and it produces light. It's good for your skin. It's good for your hair. Olive oil is this amazing gift from God, but the only way that the oil can come out of the olives is it has to be pressed. Pressure has to be applied to it. And that's what's so interesting because where did Jesus spend the last night of his life? In the Garden of Gethsemane. The Bible actually says, and I want you to listen to this, listen to this. The Bible says that Jesus prayed so intensely while he was in the Garden of Gethsemane that he actually sweat drops of blood. And that's an actual medical phenomenon. It's called hematidrosis. And what happens is sometimes people, when they're under extreme stress, extreme pressure, the stress of that pops capillaries underneath their skin and they'll actually sweat blood. And that's what happened to Jesus. He was under extreme pressure in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was praying the night before he was crucified. You know, there's a story in the Gospels of the woman who she breaks the, the jar, the alabaster jar of perfume, this $30,000 bottle of perfume, and she pours it out on the feet of Jesus. Well, the only way that perfume could have been poured out is first it had to be broken. It had to be crushed. Here's something else to think about. Where do diamonds come from? Now, diamonds don't come from coal. That's a myth. and actually comes from the movie Superman. You know where diamonds come from? Diamonds come from carbon. And carbon comes from plants and animals being exposed to extreme heat and pressure. Listen to this. I think you'll find this so interesting. Diamonds are formed 90 miles underground at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Diamonds are formed by extreme heat and pressure. But that's what it takes to turn carbon into a diamond. And that's what God does. God brings treasure from trials. And often he allows trials in our lives, as Peter says in those two verses that I read earlier, to test us, to refine us, to purify us. Do you know, that, do you know how you, you value gold? The value of gold is based upon its purity. The purer that it is, the more valuable that it is. 100% pure gold is 24 karat gold. But the interesting thing about gold is gold appears naturally in nature, but rarely does it appear in a pure form okay gold if you just if you went out and you found gold in the mountains somewhere usually it can take contain small but significant amounts of other metals such as copper silver palladium mercury and what those other metals do is they affect the color of the gold and they affect the strength of the gold they, they, they change the color of it and they weaken it so in order to purify gold to make it more beautiful more stronger more valuable to remove the flaws and the imperfections, you know what you have to do with gold? You have to put it in the fire. You have to melt it. And as the gold is in the fire, what will end up happening is as the gold begins to boil, the impurities in the gold will come to the surface. And then the goldsmith, he has a special tool where he scrapes off those impurities. And he keeps doing it until the gold becomes 100% pure. What's fascinating about gold is, you know, you can actually purify gold to the point where it actually becomes translucent. You can actually see through it. And the way a goldsmith knows that the gold has become pure is when the goldsmith can see his own reflection in it. And the same is true of us. You know what God is trying to do? God wants to see his reflection in us. He wants to purify so we become transparent. And when he looks at us, he sees himself. And that's what God is doing. Well, that's what Peter says God is doing when we're going through trials, you know what he's doing? He's bringing treasure out of the trial. He's testing our faith. He's purifying it. He's turning up the heat on our lives to bring the weaknesses and the impurities to the surface so that he can remove them because he loves us. And Peter says, that, you, know, Peter says you know what the most precious thing in the world is? And I want you to hear this. You know what the most valuable thing in the world is? And I've come to realize this you know, at my stage in life. The most valuable thing in the world, more than, worth more than all the, all the money in the world, is faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus is a miracle. And God loves faith in Jesus so much that you know what he does when he finds it in somebody? He wants to purify it, he wants to refine it, and he wants to make it greater. Jesus said, every branch of me that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit, and it's the same principle. 
And so think about it for a second. What are the impurities or the weaknesses in our lives that God is bringing to the surface during this trial? You know, what, what have we learned about ourselves during this trial? What are those things about our lives that, you know, that, that we want to change, that we don't want to be there anymore after this trial is gone? You know, I live in New York City, and there's all these, there's all these articles about people who have left New York City because of the, because of the quarantine, and they're realizing that they don't want to come back. Now, that's kind of an extreme example, but what is something that you've realized about your life from this coronavirus trial? Maybe there's a, a career change that you want to make or a lifestyle change or a bad habit that you finally want to conquer. You know, old school Christians, they used to call like, like, a, like a, a bad habit that you couldn't really get free of. They used to call it a besetting sin. And maybe you realize through this trial that there's a besetting sin that you want to be free from. I'll tell you one thing that I've learned is I've learned that I don't want to take people for granted anymore. You know, one of the things about New York is that, you know what makes New York magical? It's the people that makes New York magical. It's not the buildings. It's not the parks. It's not the geography. It's not the food or the entertainment. It's the people that make New York, New York. And when you take the people away, New York literally has zero magic. In fact, I would rather live in Florida or California or somewhere else. But when the people are here, there's nowhere on, on planet Earth like New York City. But you take the people away and New York isn't New York. And it's made me realize how important people are and, and how much more I should value them. And I, I can't tell you how much I miss our Sunday morning gatherings. And so what's the treasure that can come out of this coronavirus trial? How can we walk away from this better? And that's what I want you to think about. And that's what we're going to talk about in just a few minutes when I wrap up. I'll tell you a couple things for me personally. One is I'm talking to my family a lot more. I'm talking to my dad almost every single day. Um, I've been working on my finances and I really encourage you, Dave Ramsey's materials are outstanding. And so just get a hold of them and work your way through them if you want to get, you know, at a stronger place with your finances. There's a ton of books I've been wanting to read. I've been focusing on some self-improvement. I've been getting my house more organized. I started exercising regularly. I, you know, I've always surfed and skateboarded, but I, I don't, I haven't been doing so much of that. So I've been realizing I need to just work out more. I've been doing that. And I've realized through this coronavirus trial that there's significant things about my life that I want to change when this is over. But that's just me. What about you? What is God showing you? What's God bringing to the surface in your life during this coronavirus trial? What about your life do you want to change? You know, if our life ever gets back to some kind of new normal, what about your life do you want to be different? You know what else I've realized and, and lean in for a second and just give me your attention is, you know what I've realized about pandemics, what I've realized about viruses is that they're magnifiers, they're accentuators. Look at the things that this has shown us about our government. Look at the things that's shown us about our society and our economy. And the, and the question I have for you is, what is this magnifying or accentuating in your life? There's a guy named Viktor Frankl. He was an Austrian Jewish psychotherapist. And he was imprisoned by the Nazis. He survived four Nazi concentration camps. And afterwards, he wrote a book about it called Man's Search for Meaning. And he has this great line. Listen to what he says. He says, when we're no longer able to change a situation, we're challenged to change ourselves. And so the question I have for you and I, what do we want to change about ourselves as a result of this trial? Proverbs 4.26 says, ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. And the question I want to ask all of us is, where are our lives going? What path are we on? And where is that path taking us? And if we don't like that path, you know what? Today's the day to change it. There's a great book. I was going to recommend it earlier. I want you to take a look at this. Look at this with me. There's an excellent book. It's called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I, I can't encourage you enough to pick this book up or get the audio book of it. And, and one of the things Stephen Covey talks about is the seven habits of highly effective people is he says, always begin with the end in mind. And here's something I want you to think about it and lean in. He says, this is what you need to do with your life. You need to think about your funeral and the memorial service at your funeral. And all these people are getting up and they're talking about your life. What do you want them to say about you when your life is done? What do you want the legacy of your life to be? Well, you have to start, you have to start with the end in view and then you got to work backwards. And so we need, to, we need to structure our lives today so that the end of our lives end up where we want them to end up. Ponder the path of your view. Where are our lives going? 
And if they're not going the way we want them to go, then we need to change that today. You know what I think one of the things that God did with the coronavirus, I don't think God caused the coronavirus, but I think he's using it, is I think God is using the coronavirus to get our intention. You know, one day I, w- I went out to the Verrazano Bridge, and the Verrazano Bridge is this big bridge that goes from Brooklyn to Staten Island. And I was looking up at this bridge, and I was thinking, man, God, you put the whole world on pause. Lord, you are amazing. And I think that God allowed the coronavirus to put the whole world on pause, to, 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 to cause it to stop and to get us to think about our lives. And if we need you to change our lives and to go in a positive direction. And here's the thing. If we use the coronavirus to change the direction of our lives in a positive direction, then the coronavirus could actually be one of the best things that ever happened to us. We could come out of this stronger and better than we were before we went into it. Do you know that there's companies right now that are making billions off of the coronavirus? Amazon, Lysol, 3M, Zoom, YouTube Live, Netflix, anybody that's making personal protective equipment? Well, you know what? If we use this virus correctly, we could come out of it stronger as well. We could come out of it wiser. And if we redeem this experience, we could come out of it stronger. And so here's some challenges I want to give you. I want to challenge you, maybe keep a coronavirus journal. Write down all the things you feel like God has shown you during this time. Write out ways that you want your life to be different when this is over. Uh, Maybe you realize that there's some things you want to change about your life. Well, you know what? Here's some great self-improvement books that I encourage you to pick up and read if you just want to begin to kind of change the direction of your life. And take a look at these. One is called Start With Why, and it's by Simon Sinek. It's an excellent book. Another one by James Collins and Jerry R. Porras is Built to Last. A really excellent book. It's probably the easiest to read of all of these. It's an excellent book called Essentialism by Greg McCown. Super good book. Again, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People is an excellent book. And a really, really, really just killer book. I I really encourage you to pick it up or get the audio book. It's good to great by Jim Collins. Okay? Pick these books up. Read these books. Invest in yourself. You know what the most valuable thing you have is you. And invest in yourself and use this time to allow God to transform you and to change you. You know, for me personally, there's some accounting books that I've got to read. And it's like church accounting books. It's like the most boring thing on planet Earth, but I got to read it. I've been trying to read Calvin's Institutes. And here's one last thought I have for you. And I'm going to kind of land this plane is in monasteries, monks have what's called a rule of life. And what the rule of life does is 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 it kind of governs your life. And if you live in a monastery, your whole life is governed by this rule of life. Well, I challenge you to make your own rule of life. You could say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to bed at 10 a.m. I'm going to get up at 6 a.m. I'm going to read my Bible and journal for a half hour every day. I'm going to pray for 15 minutes. I'm going to go for a walk for 30 minutes. I'm going to exercise for 10 minutes. I'm going to put in an eight-hour work day. I'm going to make sure that I eat well, that I'm not drinking too much coffee or I'm not drinking too much coffee or eating too much sugar. I'm going to make sure I connect with someone personally every day. I'm going to, every day I'm going to do some kind of self-improvement thing. I'm going to listen to a podcast or I'm going to read a part of a book or or I'm going to download an audio book. I'm going to avoid bad habits like too much television or too much social media. But you know what? Put together your own personal rule of life. Structure your life, discipline your life, and then stick to it and watch how much your life will begin to change in a positive direction. And it doesn't take that much time to, to completely turn your life around in a different direction. It's not legalism. It just gives our lives some structure. And it makes sure that we're making the best use of our time. But look, I believe that God wants to bring treasure out of every trial in our life. God is for you. God loves you. And God wants to bring treasure out of whatever you're going through in life right now. Listen to these two verses. God says in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans of good and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. And Paul writes in Romans 8, 28, for I know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. And I think that that's Paul's reflection on this pattern that you see throughout the whole Bible, that God is always bringing treasure out of trials. And here's a final thought I want to leave you with. And just lean in, give me your attention for one more moment. This is kind of the most important point of all. You know what the greatest example of all in the Bible is of treasure coming out of trial? is the death of Jesus. Look at the death of Jesus. He's arrested. He's falsely accused. He's unjustly tried. 
He's abandoned by his friends and his family. He's whipped within an inch of his life. He's, and then he's crucified unjustly. But through his death, through Jesus' trial, God brought salvation to the whole world. It's the ultimate treasure from trial. Like grapes and olives, it says in Isaiah 53, 5, that Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. And out of his grave, out of his death, came resurrection life, came eternal life. And all of us who are watching today, if Jesus is the Lord of our lives, we can have eternal life because Jesus went through this horrible trial. Out of that trial came the greatest treasure in time and eternity and all of, all of eternity. And so we put all our hope in Jesus. We put all our trust in Jesus. We look to Jesus. We worship Jesus. And we rest in Jesus. Jesus is our peace. He's our Sabbath rest. He's our shalom. And I would encourage you. Here's, here's my final closing encouragement. Then I'm done. If you don't know Jesus, I would encourage you to give your life to Jesus Christ today. I think if this, if this coronavirus has shown us anything, it's shown us how temporal and how fragile life is. And so you don't want to go one moment of your life without making sure you're right with Jesus. And then for those of us who do know Jesus, this is my final thought, is rest in Jesus. Trust in Jesus. And rest in Jesus' supernatural ability to pull a divine rabbit out of a hat, to work all things together for good, and to bring treasure out of every single trial in our life. Because that's who he is. Amen? Let me pray, and then we'll just open it up for dialogue. Father God, I thank you for everybody that's watching. I pray, Lord, that for those who are going through a trial right now, Lord, I pray you would encourage them, you give them perseverance. I pray for anyone who doesn't know you, Lord, that today would be the day that they would surrender their life to you. And I pray for all of us that do know you, Jesus, that we become better from this trial, God. We would come out of this coronavirus stronger, more like Jesus, pure, more like you, Father God, and that we would rest in you, Jesus. We would trust in you. We would know that you love us and you're for us and that you're good. Thank you for this time. Thank you for everybody paying attention and bless our dialogue now, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, guys, let's, let's open it up for a little bit of dialogue. And maybe, maybe some of you guys, you can give an example of when God brought a treasure out of a trial in your life. And I'm actually going to call somebody out. I'm going to call Judd Heald out. And Judd, can you give us an example? I know you have examples. I know you have crazy examples of God bringing treasure out of trial. So why don't you just share something from the group about when God brought treasure out of a trial in your life? Right. Can you guys hear me good? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, one of my big testimonies is breaking my neck snowboarding. I uh, should have died from it. But it really turned me around to maybe realize that you know, tomorrow wasn't promised to me. Um, and, and for me personally, I really felt like, you know, God had a calling on my life and that maybe if I wasn't going to use my calling for the Lord's glory and his honor, that maybe he wasn't going to keep me around to pull people away from uh, what he had called me to. I mean, we, we all have been, God's gifts are irrevocable, right? So if God has given me a gift to be a leader or to, to point people to something, I'm either going to get attention to point and pull people away from Christ, or I'm going to get attention to point towards Christ. So that's a big one for me. And then obviously like, with, you know, we, we built a warehouse in the last year and that was total just, all right, Lord, my wife wants to move closer to family so that she has backup when I travel. I'm going to give up this skate ministry that I've worked years to get going here in Joplin, move to a place that really doesn't have a scene and I'm going to build a scene and people are going to still come to me, I imagine. And, and you know, and as soon as I pretty much opened the doors, then the whole Corona thing happened. And now I'm like skating it by myself being like, I just wish people could come over and hang out and skate. But next thing I know, everything I need will be done. And when people come, everything will be done that I need done. And I won't have to worry about the stuff anymore, but I've been given ample time to get that stuff done. So it's huge blessings in disguise. One of my favorite Judd Heald stories is one time their tour van that they were in, uh, the, the engine broke. I think he blew a, a head gasket or something. And overnight, Judd rebuilt the engine from, from, from scratch. So isn't that true, Judd? Yeah, and our transition from Mana to Untitled, uh, there were, we were meeting in the middle to switch vans, and there was a demo. 
And my van showed up with a blown head gasket. And so we had to be at the event the next afternoon. And so me and this, this guy, Mountain Man, proceeded to rebuild the, uh, to, to redo the head gaskets overnight. And yeah, I remember where <laughs> I was at one point, I was like up to my elbows in kerosene and the guys come out thinking it would be all funny to throw firecrackers. And I'm like, I'm like literally like drenched in kerosene. They're throwing firecrackers at me. And that's oh my God. the biggest freak out moment of my life. <laughs> people. But um, yeah, it, it was rad. But you know, the next day we did the event, I, you know, we were blessed to see people come to the Lord and uh, you know, we drove home with that, that van the next day and you know, from North Carolina all the way to Missouri. So didn't you pull the engine completely out? You like pulled it out, rebuilt it, and then put it no, back? No, no, just the head gasket. So it was just in a van. You pretty much, you take the, the dog, dog box off and you can just basically work on the whole top of the engine uh, there in the van. But yeah, we, the engine was, com you know, the whole top end off it. See, you guys have no idea what a legend Judd Heald is. Can we just give Judd a big round of applause? Everybody on Zoom, absolute legend. All right, I'm going to call somebody else out. Bill, Bill Mowry. Billy, I'm sure you've got some some treasure out of some trials. Oh man, okay. Um, Probably too many to count, huh? The uh huh. Yeah, I mean, you you lived across the hall from me when a lot of them were going. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just say the two years of living and serving with Mike uh, were a treasure and a trial at the same time. So uh, let's. Okay, so Mike never heard the story. I, it's it's confession time. Luckily, nothing ever bad happened in the end of the story, but Mike goes out of town. Uh, I was a deacon at, at, at Movement at the time and uh, living with Mike, and I was driving the truck into the city uh, with the trailer hitch, and the trailer hitch has all the equipment. So I get in the city just fine. So I'm like, nothing was broken on the way in. We're, we were all good. I forgot the laptop in the hallway in Queens. Oh, my God. I had to go get the truck. And I'm booking it. And for those of you who don't know, Sunday can be kind of mellow in the city, but once it gets to a certain time period, it's going to take you an hour just to get between boroughs, no problem. So I'm booking it. Uh, I hit a pothole pretty hard, and I look behind, and the trailer is up and sideways. <laughs> and I'm like, Jesus, no, Jesus, no. I just was yelling, Jesus, no, a million times out loud. And the trailer just comes back around, bounces around real quick, and I'm just like, it's like one of those oh shoot moments and you're like hearts racing and you're like the lord just delivered me from some something that could have really just been really bad and mike's not here um so i mean but honestly like living with mike set me up for the career that i have today and i got to just from being involved in skateboarding in new york city living with mike doing movement i was pointed to a uh, certification course at a google partner school that you know my parents helped me go to i'd already had my bachelor's working in ministry trying to figure out this digital marketing thing and uh realistically that time period is the entire reason that i'm able to support myself in a career and a job position today that i fought eight years and the lord kept me from eight years but then provided it to me and and it's just been yeah it, it was a total godsend i think i grew 10 years in two years living in new york and i'm i miss it every day yeah, I'm really, I'm really proud of you, Billy. I'm proud of, proud of how you went back to Florida and got a good job. And so I'm super stoked on you, brother. Thank you, man. I love you. And I'm super proud of you. I'm super proud of what Movement's doing. And I'm thankful to see it. Thankful to have uh, technology so I can still hear your sermons. Yep, yep. I know, just for you guys to know, every book behind Mike, he's definitely probably read. And I guarantee he read most of them in two days. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to call out Diana. Diana Rodriguez, how are you? Diana, can you share with us, why don't you share with us maybe, what's something that you learned about yourself during the coronavirus? Like, you know, especially, I think you're in New York City still like the rest of us. And so, you know, being trapped in our apartments and, and the pressure of living in the city and everything like that. Like what, what is, maybe what's something that you've learned about yourself from the coronavirus trial, you know, that maybe you, um, want, to, you want to change or whatever stuff? So. so I feel like, um like this this moment kind of like like kind of like put us into like a forced time that well like this was for me like a forced time that maybe like we were leaving to the side you know and we weren't taking the time to to like really put ourselves there and honestly like it kind of like gave me a lot of time to finally get like do self-reflection that I really needed 
um, and able to like look inside and see like what God wants me to do. And also, um, to be honest, I'm, I've been kind of lost for a little bit because I put skate ministry on pause. Like, you know, I had this thing called Skate for Jesus in New York City. And, um, you know, we were like, you know, Mike and I we would like help each other out and stuff like that from a distance and stuff like that and like really encourage each other. Um, I actually put it on pause for like a, the past few years. And um, during this time, God is kind of like showing me like, look, I, I, I did that for you. Um, and you know, you were a great blessing for like skate ministry in New York city and everything. But you know, like I use that to do what I'm doing for you now. And now you have like a new ministry. Like it's kind of crazy. Cause like I did that. I did like, like skate ministry for a very long time. And my family watched me do that. And like, it'd be like Sundays and Saturdays, like almost like random weeks, you know, that I wasn't really spending time with my family. And throughout that whole entire time, my family, like I'm actually like one of the only Christians in my whole entire family. Like my whole entire family is Catholic. I come from like a Catholic family. And through that entire time, I prayed for like my cousins for eight years so that they can like get to know Jesus. And like, finally, like literally like last year, God started to move in like all their hearts and like they started coming to church and everything and it's almost like like that that time in my life was a pause like paused for me but it's like god has something new for me now and he's like i want you to be available to your family now like they need you as they walk like and they would go into this journey now so it's kind of like this coronavirus time kind of like made me realize that this pause was for a reason because god needs to build me like inside like you know i don't know how to explain them but yeah that's what has been happening so by the way the, the, all these guys are heroes billy's a hero just for having lived with me and Judd, <laughs> judd's a hero just nah, no, don't, no. don't 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 paint it like that man you did you did a lot for me so i no, can't, no. can't say that. and judd is just like a global hero and then diana's a hero because she was the most consistent coordinator of skate ministry in New York City. Yeah, she give was. Diana, a round of applause. Was. Stephen Wolf. Stephen Wolf had New Jersey on lock, but Diana was for so long was the main person. A story all day. You're. <laughs> this makes it go over every 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 park. <laughs> uh, so many. Trust me, like hundreds of like skateboarders in New York, at least heard some presentation of the gospel because of Diana. She's a legend. She's an absolute legend. So yeah. I'm real proud of her. Is Motor still on here? Motor, are you on here? The Motor step away. Hasoy, can you hear me? Unmute yourself, Hasoy. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Hey, hey guys. I taught on um, how God brings treasure out of trials. Can you give us an example of when God brought an amazing treasure out of a trial in your life? I'm sure you got tons of good stories. Can, can you share something? Yeah, I probably got a ton of, ton of those good ones. But, you know, I came on the very end. I knew, you know, I'm just driving, so I'm in my car. Just pulled over to get some food for the kids, and I just thought I'd just tune in really quickly. And I caught the very end of your your message about the greatest treasure. And, you know, when I think about my life, I think about the treasure in me that I never knew I had. No matter how good I was, no matter how many accomplishments that I succeeded at and, and awards and just, you know, world records, I think that, you know, I didn't know there was a treasure. And, you know, of course, the greatest treasure is that, you know, Jesus treasured us. You know what I mean? That he would even die on a cross so that we can have eternal life to spend eternity with him. You know, I, I see that most of us on here are pretty, pretty saved. You know what I mean? It's great to see Mulder and, and Judd and, and the, the kid with the soy shirt. That was amazing. Yeah. But, you know, the, the treasure, you know, that's so significant that we never knew that God could use us. You know what I mean? That God could take a kid like me that was so jacked up, so full of himself, so like caught up in the world and what the world had to offer, whether it be the money, the fame, 
the the power, the popularity. I mean, it, it's just it's such like a stranglehold on people who are good people. I would consider myself even today, I was a good person. But at the end of the day, I didn't know the true treasure that was on the inside of me. And and to figure figure that out through a trial. How's this? In the trial and tribulation, I discovered the treasure. Amen. That's good. And in that place was where I dug deep into God's word. And God's word told me that he had a plan for my life. That's good. That, that when I read Romans 8, 28, sitting there on my triple decker bunk bed in prison, and it says that, and we know all things work together for good to them that love God, who are called according to his birth. And for me, it made complete sense that God would take even that and it would be worked together for my good who are called. And then I realized, you mean you've called me? And, and, and immediately I was just like, my life was full of purpose, passion. And I think that's the greatest treasure that we'll ever get to experience and to be able to spend. And then we get to spend our treasure of not knowing this on others and our time here on this planet to be able to be a bright light that Jesus says we are the light of the world. And, you know, I love, you know, preaching. I love going out, especially with like, you know, the, the stories of with Judd, even with Mulder, like, you know, you, Mike, I mean, Diane in, in New York. I mean, it's just incredible, you know, the, the seasons of our lives, but just to, you know, sit here and get to fellowship with you guys for a quick minute has been amazing. And, uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that the treasure that I've found that I can, you know, pass it on and to have other people find their treasure because, you know, and their treasure is their purpose and it's their plan. You know what I mean? It's what God can do in their life. Eternity is the ultimate gift, but being used by God, I tell you, there's nothing like sharing the gospel with somebody, leading them to Jesus praying for somebody, them getting healed by the power of, of, of who God is and, and to do ministry. I mean, praise the Lord. I'm still, you know, sober 20 years and like five months. And Amazing. it's all because of the grace of God, the power of God. And you know what I mean? I, I, it's a miracle. I still think it's a miracle that a kid like me who, you know, came from such a gnarly background is still sober just that right there yeah and that gives a lot of people hope that gives a lot of people you know and it's for other people too you know what i mean it's not just for me to just tote around and, and spout like i'm cool because i'm sober but it gives people hope yeah. that they can do it too if i can do it they can do it and it starts by finding that treasure and uh i love you guys i could talk all day i i'm a talker Perfect. Hey, can we give a sway round of applause for 20 years of sobriety? Man, that is amazing. Good job, man. Ooh, what? And you're, you're a husband and a father and a pastor and a preacher. And you're, we love you. We love you, Christian. That was excellent. Thank you very much for sharing. If Tristan Strange, are you still on? She wanted to share something. Tristan, are you still on? Uh, I'm not a she, but can I share? <laughs> Absolutely. I, <laughs> <laughs> please share, Tristan. Yeah, I um, I wanted to uh, you know, we we're talking about treasures from from trials and like this uh, situation that happened to me in 2017 came to mind where like I had stepped out in faith and and moved from from Orlando, Florida, all the way to Brisbane, Australia, and I was uh, a part of a ministry called the God Bowl, where we have this like epic bowl at our yeah. church. And Christian's actually been there, which is like pretty yeah. sick. And um, sick. so so I started this, I started helping them with the ministry called Skate Park Shepherds. And I met this, I mean, my future wife, who I've now been dating for three years. And this crazy circumstances ended up happening where I had to leave the country to get a work visa. And I didn't have enough money to like, really get anywhere but I could afford a like one-way ticket to Hawaii and uh so basically like I got myself to I mean not Hawaii excuse me I got myself to New Zealand and my plan was I was gonna get in New Zealand I was gonna stay with the skate ministry there 
and I, while I got my work and holiday visa. But what ended up happening was as I got into the immigration, these guys fully, like the immigration officers, they tagged me and I had to go and have a conversation with them and they asked me straight up how much money I had. Oh. And I mean, you're, you're supposed to have uh, like a thousand per month that you're there. And I, I probably had about $400. And uh, so they like found that out and they put me into this back room and for the next seven hours, they, they had taken my phone and for seven hours straight, they're asking me questions. They're saying, why are you in New Zealand? And, and I would like, I thought I was kind of funny because I would pull out the great commission and I'd go right here. Jesus says right here, go into all the, all of the world and preach the good news. And that's what I came here to do. And they didn't really find it as funny as, as, as I did. And uh, basically they said, we're not letting you into New Zealand and we have to figure out what we're going to do with you because we don't have any flights that are going to America. And, uh, and I was so super stressed because I had my girlfriend, I had my ministry, everything like God wanted me to be in Australia, but I didn't have an Australian visa at that time. And uh, man, like I, I did my best to, to find favor with these guards. But I tell you guys the truth, I ended up locked in a tiny room in the New Zealand airport for three days and three nights. Oh my gosh. And on the fourth morning, because they had, no joke, they lost my passport in the airport. And they're like, well, we can't send you anywhere until we find your passport. Long story short, like on the fourth day, I had gained favor with these guys and they, they, they're sending me back to Brisbane, Australia, which I was kind of tripping on. Like, I don't have an Australian visa. If you send me back to Australia without a visa and they choose to deny me and I get deported for the second time this week from Australia, I cannot return for seven years. So the situation came up where I'm, it's me versus, I mean, it felt like an impossible situation and I'm praying and I'm going, God, like, you've made my path straight and you've shown me that I'm supposed to be here in, in Brisbane and now I'm being sent to Brisbane, but with no visa. I need you God to make a way. And as I pull up and I get off the plane and I go up to the immigration desk, I had my, our, our ministry shirt on called red frogs. And I have the logo on the chest of my hoodie and I walk up to the desk and I tell the immigration officer my story and I go, man, look, I, I'm in your hands, you know? And he looks at me and he goes, hey man, look, I see that Red Frog logo on your shirt. And he recognizes it and goes, if you're with Red Frogs, I know that you're a good dude and you're a godly dude and I'm a Christian. And the person to my left and the officer to my right, they would have sent you back to America and you would not be able to return for seven years. But I know that you're a good dude and I'm gonna give you a three month tourist visa. That's awesome. So from, from the ridiculous <laughs> trial, I got into, I got back into Australia for three more months and, and we like continued in our skate ministry and we held a conference and that was such a long time ago now. And now I'm on a partner visa and I'm getting married at the end of the year, but it's been a, like, that was one of those decisive moments, you know, where God, yeah. you, you know, he parted the, the sea for me. That's amazing. It, it was great. Good story, Tristan. I'll share yeah, thanks for letting me share. Absolutely. I'll share a quick story, and then I, I want to get Mulder on here. Um, when I was with Walking on Water, we were filming a segment in Peru, and I've always I've wanted to go to Machu Picchu since I was a little kid, and Machu Picchu is like that little, that, sit, that hidden city up in the Andes Mountains. And when we were leaving the airport in Lima, one of our filmers got, he got caught up in customs, and so I had to, I had to miss our flight so he so he, I could so I could kind of take care of him. And he was able to get on a flight the next day. I wasn't gonna be able to fly out of Lima for for four days. And so then I went to this internet cafe, and I was able to find a flight out to Machu Picchu. I went up there and spent like three days up there. Remember that gnarly trial. I got the opportunity of a lifetime to go to Machu. Picchu. All right, but hey, I want to get Motor on here. Motor, and make sure everyone has your microphones muted. Someone's not muted. Hey, what's up, bud? Motor, give us an example from your life where, where God has brought treasure out of the trial in your life. And by the way, 
Can we just hear, can we hear for Pastor Mulder, by the way? Pastor Mulder. <laughs> uh, hey, uh, you know, I think for me it was, is, was just dealing with anxiety, right? So I had really bad anxiety when I was 16. It all came from, you know, my before my use of drugs and stuff. And then um, I think um, in 2013, it just came really strong, right? Um, and I mean, you know, the Bible says having done all to stand, but trying to make sense of it, like, like, you know, doing everything what I can do in the natural, going to doctors. Um, I didn't take any, I, I took actually medication for like two, two months. Um, but it actually had these crazy side effects where I actually was feeling depressed. But I actually really, it really turned, it had me really turn to God, right? Most people have faith until they really need it. And so now I, I really, the only way I could deal with anxiety is I surrender it to God. But the, really how God's used it is, um, you know, he's really used it to be able to speak to people who actually struggle with anxiety. It's funny, during this whole pandemic thing, like actually, um, I haven't been struggling with anxiety. It's almost like, like, it's like, like God prepared me for this, right? And I find myself ministering to people with this anxiety. Um, I mean, about anxiety, and I, it's like Holy Spirit ministry. And then also, can you turn it down, Elijah? Sorry, I have kids here. Turn it down, I'm, I'm talking. And I also feel like even just, um, so that's been the big one for me lately, you know, is just um, how I'm like, God, how are you gonna use this? And it's like almost like embarrassing, cause like, man, Christians shouldn't have anxiety. Christians shouldn't have a, a panic attack. Like this shouldn't be part of my testimony. And like, I, you know, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. And I'm like, I believe that God heals. But like, you know, when the manifestation of your healing is not coming, it's like, and I'm still feeling anxious. I'm like, Lord, I just surrender my life to you. And uh, just being in that olive press, that Gethsemane for me, like where like my theology is, is in the tension of a trial. Like, who am I believing? You know, like Isaiah says, who has believed the report of the Lord? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Lord, I just believe you. And, um, it's really squeezed out like, wow, I actually, I may, I'll make it. Like when, when, um, when, when, when tough times come, I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm breathing through this. I find myself always on the other side overcoming. And not just that, I realize I also have a more empathy when I'm ministering the gospel. Like right now while we're texting, right? Like, and I just want to say this, everyone on this call, is an original expression of how God made you, right? We all can't be Mike Doyle. We all can't be a Christian Asoy. We all can't be Yuli and Tony, but you all, you all could be your own Bill, your own Drew, your own Richard, right? Like, but we can only do that when we're abiding in Christ. So that's the greatest investment that we can have right now is abiding in Christ. So right now God has me working and I'm, in, I'm in doing the skate ministry. But as you're talking like this client, one of my clients, right? That I sell houses for a living. But it's not about the houses. It's about souls. Like, it really is about souls. And she's texting me. She's like, hey, I'm still trying to carry on this conversation we had earlier. She's like, you know, she's like, if there's a God, like, um, are there any other pl uh, planets with intelligent life forms? How come kids are born with diseases? What would be the reason for my friend, six-year-old little boy who died of cancer that is 90% curable? Those are legitimate questions. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, Holy Spirit, like, help me. So, because the Holy Spirit, at the end of the day, he is, he is, um, he's the witness that gives witness to Jesus, right? And so, um, it's just this interesting time, and I really believe we all could be at the same place. We all are at the right place at the right time when we're abiding in Christ. Okay. And I feel like this pandemic, these trials has really squeezed out, like, man, how is, how genuine, how real is my relationship with God? How, like... Like, how much do I really lean on the Holy Spirit or do I lean on my own, my, my own, you know, my own strength, right? And I think for me, this trial of this pandemic has really squeezed out, like, what my, what, like, what am I really made of, right? There's a scripture that I like to share. It's like, when your strength, uh, like, if, if your strength fails in the day of adversity, your strength is weak. Yep. And I was like, ooh, that's gnarly, Lord. So I feel like this is a great time in this in this pandemic to really look at our relationship with God and are we ministering out of our own 
gifting or even out of our own strength or are we relying on the holy spirit for everything and i really love what you said mike about we did the same thing we looked at our finances we looked at our prayer life together my wife and i like we pray every morning for a, a half an hour before we start the day which we never done before and we realized like when we have challenges it's cool because we were prayed up so we don't get easily offended um and we're not striving like we know, like we, we all have jobs, but like Mike Jesus, I'm not gonna, I'm still gonna operate it out of integrity. I'm not gonna do something funny to like pay my bills. Like you're, you know, you're Jehovah Jireh. Yep. So um, it's been a real beautiful time. I, and I shared this two weeks ago. I believe that we could thrive when we're in the Holy Spirit in a time of crisis. Absolutely, absolutely. And you think, let me share Mike. The most the most anxious I ever saw a motor and we had a lot of adventures together <laughs> was when we were in El Salvador. Oh, bro. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you had to say. Yeah. The, the only the other time was when we were in Amsterdam. Uh, dude, El Salvador. Mike was just flying, dude. Mike's like, I've been there before and I knew like El Salvador is crazy gangland, right? Like it makes it makes LA look weak. Oh, and then yeah. I carry it. Here we are. And the last time I was in El Salvador, I was with a guard with an AK-47. And we're, Mike's just being led by the Holy Spirit. And I was tripping. I needed Jesus right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, remember, we, I, were you with us when we, we walked to the beach and the guy had like the sawed-off shotgun, like the copper-plated sawed-off shotgun? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, you, I saw you anxious in Amsterdam at one time, but El Salvador was the craziest. But Love you, Mike. I love you too, Richard. You're a legend. Everyone, let's give Richard a round of applause for sharing. Awesome. Amazing, amazing word. And then lastly, why don't we, why don't we bring it back to Tony and Yuli. And Tony, Tony and Yuli are, they're warriors. They've been through so much for the kingdom. Yuli, why don't you close this out? With one, just give us one story of the treasure out of the trial. And then we'll let you kind of land this plane and wrap up our time. Well, well, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to bring it to what I'm going through right now. I mean, I think I have found myself working really hard, trying to make a, a, a good income for the family and um, less time reading my Bible and more time just being relevant, you know, to everyone, you know, and being the yes man and, you know, and, just you know compromising a little bit you know and uh i remember bragging to my wife my wife and i had a pretty uh hard day we were, we had a kind of a falling out a little bit and uh if you're married for more than 10 years or five years you know what i'm talking about and um i was really arrogant about oh i'm making this money i'm doing this and um i found myself in the pandemic i, I was the first one to, i didn't have any income you know and i felt myself i felt i felt like i was in a crossroad where what do i do i'm isolated i'm in my garage you know what am i doing you know i'm in my shop and and i i just thought of this man and it's like when i if i god basically said to me invite me in your isolation and i will show you my grace through your reflection and and and, and that's what i was like i heard you know and Tony being a legend, you know, and uh, she mentioned doing a bi this Bible study. This Tuesday night Bible study is very special because it was the Bible study that I got saved at, you know. It was Tuesday night. I walk into a skate park, Ramp 48. I gave my life to the Lord, you know. And I was a huge skateboarding fan, man. Like, I, I skated in the 80s. I loved to skate. Like, my kids skate. Like, skating was, was huge attention you know, brought a lot of attention to me, you know, and um, I just, you know, it was just really special. And uh, I found myself going, you know what, I'm going to invite God. And it was one of those prayers, like inviting him in your heart. I already had him in my heart, but I had to invite him back into my like mess, like where, like where he's showing who I truly am so that I could see his grace when I look at myself. And you know what that did? It allowed me to give more grace and love for people. And I'm telling you, man, like I have a long road ahead of me, yeah. but I am so thankful for these Bible studies, man. Yeah. And because I really just want to encourage people, you know, yeah. and that's all it is, you know, where we can all come on the same platform and just 
talk about our trials and what God's doing. So yeah, that's huge what he's been doing with me, you know. Awesome. Love you, Lee. So Tony and Neely, you guys wanna you wanna close this out in prayer? And... Yeah. Um listen, I, I didn't know about if I was gonna share this or not, but I'm going to because I just want you guys to be praying. I have a friend. I'm not going to say his name or anything. I know the Lord knows. And um, he, he lost his, him and his wife lost his, his first born son, um, 14 month old, um, a terrible accident. Um, and he was in life support and we were all praying, you know, like, Oh, God's going to deliver him. God's going to deliver us. And, and uh, that wasn't in the cards, you know? And, um, so I just want you guys to be praying for that family. I mean, it was on the news as a kid drowned and so many people are just hating on them. You know, it's just crazy when you see the world and you're just like, oh my gosh. But then you, you know, as, as a Christian, you know, it's grace, love, mercy, like, you know, and I can't imagine what he's, he's going through. I lost my mom last year and, you know, that was a heavy one, you know, and just can't imagine. So just be praying if you guys would be praying for them, you know, um, an amazing skater, you know, like he lived in my house for about eight months, but, um, yeah, just to be praying for them. Well, Yuli, why don't, why don't you close this out and why don't you close out in prayer and why don't you pray for him and let, let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. Let, let's agree with Yuli. Yeah. Um, and Yuli pray for yourself. Cause we want to, we want to agree together for you. Yeah. And we want to agree together for your ministry, and then we'll agree together for this family with this with this boy that they lost. Okay, so you close yeah. down prayer. Father, I just thank you, Lord, and God, you, thank you for your mercy and your grace in my life. And God, you know that I'm still working on on the kinks, and but Lord, I'm just thankful that I have your word, and that I have <clears throat> just your hope, you know, Lord. And I just ask. Again, God, that you continue to discipline me so that I can um, continue to invite you in my isolation, my isolation, and that I'm faithful to go to your word and uh, to be a light. It's just such a privilege, God, to, to be that in my life. And uh, Lord, and I just pray for my family. And I pray as we're all stuck in the house and that we can continue uh, to abide in you. And I'm so thankful for my sons and my daughter and seeing what you've been doing in their lives. Cause you know, for two of them, they're adults, you know, Lord, but they're praising you. And I'm just so thankful. And that's your grace. And Lord, I just pray for my wife that, uh, she's my best friend, you know, and, uh, just pray for her and, and, uh, just who she is, you know, and in, in the time of my weakness, she's, she's the strength. And uh, so I'm just thankful, Lord, uh, for that. And uh, God, I just pray for uh, my brother and sister that are just struggling right now. They, the loss, but I know it's a, it's a win for you, God, because you invited that child, that soul into your kingdom. So God, I just know that, um, you know, we're made of flesh and we're going to grieve and we're going to, so Lord, I just pray uh, for those that might know who I'm talking about, you know, um, I just pray that we can continue to just be praying and being available for them, you know, God. So again, Lord, I just can't imagine what they're going through. And, you know, um, just a loss, Lord, is, is, is rough. But what I've learned is that you call people home. And uh, in time, we're going to get through it, you know, but it's such a hope for me knowing where my mom is right now has helped me so much, God. And so I'm just thankful for your grace and your mercy and for your word that says you do not, you don't want anyone to fall. <laughs> you want them all home, yeah. but it's up to us. That's the that's the, the tough thing to chew on that it's really ultimately our decision and uh, you're there with open arms but it's up to us so lord i just pray for those that don't have you right now and that are like uh molder was saying you know she's asking all these questions and god i just you keep knocking you know you keep knocking so lord um i just pray for doors open god and, and hearts to receive your 
your word. And thank you again for Mike and for his faithfulness and humility and just being a, a, a light in my life, Lord. Um, he's encouraged me so much. So, and a lot of people on this call has encouraged me. So God, thank you so much. And again, Lord, I just uh, continue to pray for Christian skaters, this network uh, that we're all members of your kingdom, Lord, and uh, your body. So again, Lord, thank you so much for those faithful that are on the call. I hope that this encourages them, and I hope that you continue to bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Yuli. That was awesome. Thank you. I'm kind of glad. Um, I'm sorry for your last for your loss and an utter beautiful soul made it to heaven. Oh, thank you. Thank Don. you, Don. Is it is okay? God bless you guys. Thanks, Thanks Mike. So Love you guys. So good to see everybody. Thanks, Mike. Good to hear from Bye. you, dude. Yeah. God bless. Later, guys. Anybody, yeah, I'm, I hate to say goodbye, you know. <laughs> Till next time.